So good evening, everybody. My name is Raya Jordan. I am the resident nutritionist at Dalesford. And um, to celebrate the launch of our supplement range, we're going to be speaking tonight about food and about supplements, but also in the middle of this pandemic. <laughs> as well and um because i think food has an enormous role to play in that and we have three really quite yes. astounding women um on the panel tonight so i'm going to get them to introduce themselves to you first could we start with you dr where did you ask for me i'm sorry there was some background sir unmute myself sorry um dr uma would you like to introduce yes of course thank you so much for uh, inviting me uh delson farm said uh, my name is dr uma naidu i'm a physician a nutritional psychiatrist in boston in the united states and i'm on faculty at harvard medical school i'm the director of nutrition and lifestyle psychiatry at um, massachusetts general hospital which is a harvard teaching hospital and it is focused on my work in nutritional and uh, nutritional psychiatry Thank you. And also, Eve, would you like to introduce yourself to the group? Yeah, so I think this is the second in six months, isn't it, event with Dalesford. So apologies if people are like, oh, she's back on again. Um, yeah, so my name's Eve Kalinic. I'm a nutritional therapist and functional medical practitioner, and I'm also an author. Um, my second book came out in August 2020, which is Happy Gut, Happy Mind, and I'm all about gut health and the gut-brain connection. And Jenna... Hello, um, my name is Jenna Hope. I'm a nutritionist. Um, I work with individuals, brands, corporate clients as well, really to promote general wellness and focus on a healthy relationship with food as well. So that's what I do. I also co-founded the Organ Juice Network, which is a business where we focus on education in schools as well. Fantastic. So thank you all for coming tonight. And, um, and it's very exciting having um, Dr. Una from America. This is one of the advantages of Zoom. Um, yes. <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to talk a little bit about diet now and um, and about the role of um, of eating well. So we've got three people who are professionally involved in nutrition. What do you think are the what would you call the foundations, the fundamental things that people should be thinking about with their diet? Please just jump in anyone who's got. So I think if we start with the basics, really we should be looking at the 80-20 rule and that is focusing on 80% of your diet being filled with whole foods, fruits, vegetables, lots of plants, beans, pulses, nuts and seeds and then animal products such as fish and meat and eggs if you do eat it, a lot of people are moving more towards a plant-based diet. But then equally allowing 15 to 20% of the time to consume those foods and drinks that you enjoy because I think ultimately if you allow yourself those foods, then you're far more likely to eat a generally healthy, balanced diet on the, at the ground of it. Whereas if you're very restrictive and you say, you know what, I'm going to try and do 100% and not eat any of those foods, then you're going to find that actually that's not sustainable in the long term. And that can generate a really poor relationship with food and definitely not something that we want to encourage. And to add, add to that, I would just say that um, I love what you said, and I would just say that for mental well-being, it's sort of the missing conversation in the room when we talk to our doctors or prescribers or nutritionists or nutritional therapists, um, in the sense that we often will talk about food or we'll talk about a, a family history of diabetes or maybe a few extra pounds that someone has gained over COVID, but no one is actually putting together the fact that food and how we eat actually affects our mental well-being. And I know that we'll cover the gut-brain axis uh, during our conversation. That is what my book is based on, which was released in September in the UK called The Food Mood Connection. But I say this because in mental well-being, many people don't realize the foods to avoid are equally important. You may be consuming or trying to, to eat a healthier diet following the rules that you just described, but you may be consuming stuff that is actually driving symptoms of depression and anxiety. And that's where nutritional psychiatry just becomes important in identifying those. So for example, 
someone may know that added and refined sugars is bad for family history of diabetes and not, not necessarily good for you overall, but it actually drives symptoms of depression and anxiety and research has shown that. Yeah, it's, it's uh, interesting I mean, people- I think, sorry, just to add into yeah, that, I think ahead. a lot of, I think that nutrition is a very noisy, misguided area. And I think there's a huge amount of confusion. And although people will say, okay, yeah, I get what you're saying there. There's so many, actually, I think I've been pleasantly surprised. I don't know about you guys and people listening, but I definitely feel like there's been less of the kind of January detoxes and diets this year I think there's definitely been a much more gentle approach to nutrition which I'm really pleased to see because mm -hmm. I'm all about I feel like when people talk about healthy nutrition they're always talking about restriction and yes what I cut out mm -hmm. what should I not eat and actually mm -hmm. particularly related to gut health because obviously that's my thing um it's more about what can you, what can we add in like let's think about nourishment because actually um even talking about things like obesity or whatever often it's actually seen as like an over nourishment but actually a lot of those people are actually malnourished so mm -hmm. i feel like move shifting the conversation away from um that restriction and what should i cut out food groups and foods to what can I add in is a much more positive way to look at nutrition. And I, I think that the shift is starting to happen there a little bit. I agree think... with I, I'm sorry, I agree with that about sort of January being a little bit gentle on people. I've heard a little bit about dry January in the United States. Um, and I've definitely heard about some detoxes, but I think generally, I think people are trying to be a little bit, perhaps having a little bit more grace with themselves around the fact that this has been a difficult time. And I completely agree with what you said, Eve. It's really about being able to know the number of things we can add in, then feel restricted. And that's where, um, you know, learning or understanding where your information is coming from becomes super important. Um, you know, for my book, I cover the research and we spend a lot of time entering end notes, which are for a want of a better word, you may call them reference points, so that a person can look up what it is and therefore understand there's so many more foods, for example, for biodiversity of your gut, just to add in as many foods that you can, the colors, the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, all of that matters. So I love that message as well, because it's, it's a way that people can embrace it more than feeling, oh, I'm going to have to give up something and it's not going to taste good. As a chef, that's the other thing that I care about. You know, it's, it's got to taste good, even if you have to make it a healthier way. And I think just to add on from that, when we take health and when we look at health, really often you do look, about, look at the physical. Of course, we've touched on the mental, but we also can't forget the social element of food and drink. And obviously, you know, given the COVID times, things have changed. But pre-COVID and when we're living what we say normal lives, really there's a huge social element to nutrition, diet, food. And if you're finding that you can't attend certain social events because you won't be able to eat you know the food that that's, that's not that's on offer that's going to have a huge negative impact on your mental well-being as well so that's definitely something to consider too yeah. and and what role do you think supplements plays in this i think that that there's a role for supplements i think that it's really important for the individual to identify the need um and make sure that the supplements they're consuming are a appropriate for them are not going to cause them um, any problems with any medications that they might be on um, but also really to look at their diet so we always say you know supplements are there to supplement the diet and not replace the diet and that's really important because I think often you know we might live in a world where people walk into health food shops and they pluck loads of supplements off the shelf because they think oh, I'll just take these and then I'll be fine. It's almost like a protective mechanism, like an anxiety um, kind of calming mechanism that you think if I take them, I'm protecting myself. But really, yes, there's a role for them, but you can't forget about the fundamental element of, of consuming a healthy diet alongside that. Yeah. So in my clinical practice in nutritional psychiatry at Mass General, how I talk about it is that you can't supplement uh, out of a bad diet, just like you can't exercise out of a bad diet. And I have nothing against supplements. I think they really do full, fulfill and fill a nutrition gap in certain individuals. Um, but, you know, I'm much more sort of lab driven and data driven around that. Uh, but there are also certain nutrients that, that the research has shown are very effective for, say, symptoms of depression, but you would have to eat a certain quantity 
quantity of it, which is not really the amount you would use in the kitchen or for culinary use. One of those examples is saffron. There's a significant amount of evidence around improvement of depression with saffron, but it, it you know, with the amount that we cook with saffron is not only is it a, a pricey ingredient, um, you wouldn't use that amount. So in certain instances like that, I really think that um, supplements are a great one. And also in the United States, many people consider omega-3 supplementation just because they want to improve symptoms of their well-being. So, um, so I think that they, they really form a good, uh, a good basis, um, but they shouldn't be the cornerstone of how you are working to improve your, your nutritional well-being. Yeah, absolutely. I think also it really depends on the supplement itself. It's a bit like if you're going to have like a grass-fed steak versus a burger. So, you know, you've got to also think about supplements in the same way that you think about diet and the quality of the ingredients mm -hmm. you're foods that you're eating um, because there are a lot of cheap supplements on the market that's mm -hmm. for sure with lots of fillers and things like that I think look I I do use supplements in my practice not for everybody but I do feel like they are they can be game-changing and I think just the way that we live our lifestyles frankly and the quality of our soil to a point means that we are missing out on some key nutrients and so I guess You've got, like, I agree with both of you guys, like, you can't just start popping pills and having, like, your nutrients that way. But there, there is definitely, I feel, and um, particularly with certain nutrients, like, we know, obviously, in the UK that, like, vitamin D, for instance, is something we do need to supplement. Um, mm -hmm. It's very hard for people to get enough omega 3 through the diet. I mean, I like oily fish, but frankly, I've got to really try hard to eat enough oily fish to get mm -hmm. my omega 3s up. So I think there are some key ones in there and that's when supplements can bridge that gap a little bit but where I see this a lot in clinical practices is a lot of people going into a lot of the time into stores with without qualified practitioners in there who are either on commission you know or they're just they like a certain brand or whatever mm -hmm. so they're kind of pushing that on on the um on the clients I think and sometimes you can yeah over supplements so I you know particularly clients that come to me say well I'm taking this for my gut health or I'm taking this because mm -hmm. I want to support my liver and I'm like well your liver's got to deal with all of that stuff so um actually I think you can take it too far and I've certainly had clients coming in taking something like you know 10 to 15 supplements and um practically rattling with them so you know mm -hmm. uh, yeah there is definitely but I do think you've got to think about the quality of the supplement itself like even things like fish oils making sure that mm -hmm. it's sourced well and all of this and I think that's a really key point with the supplements is that you know it is important to check how they're manufactured and where they're coming from yeah, another, uh, that's a great, that's a great point even to add to that. It reminded me of a situation where someone took an otherwise healthy supplement and didn't realize she was allergic to an ingredient in the supplement, which wasn't what well, it was, wasn't a filler, but it was added to the supplement, but she was actually allergic to it. So, you know, as a physician, it just, I, for me, I always have to, I always guide my patients around, um, you know, run it by your doctor, make sure that someone is vetting the process or discuss it with your therapist, your, your nutritionist so that someone is looking at what's in the in the actual supplement i think it's similar to reading about diets and and fad diets on the internet or social media for that matter you know um we i, I use uh, i very new to social media as my book was released but we really use it as an educational platform for that reason um so that people understand what they're getting into and where they can get the information vetted so that they're choosing an appropriate supplement so i agree with that and just to add that to that as well, I think that given the huge rise of um, plant-based diets, vegan, veganism, and especially veganuary at the moment, supplements can be really beneficial. So particularly vitamin B12 is incredibly difficult to get on a vegan diet. And therefore it is recommended that those following a vegan diet may benefit from a vitamin B12 supplement. So looking at your diet, trying to identify the gaps and then trying to support that with supplements can be beneficial, but I do recommend ensuring that you have got the right guidance um, to do so. Well, vitamin B12, you know, is also important for just a regular vegetarian uh, person as well. And so I would, I would agree with that even, um, sorry, I would even agree with that, Jen, and, and just add, you know, if, you, if you're going in the plant-based direction, maybe get a vitamin B12 level with your physician if you can, or consider talking to them um, or to your nutrition, nutrition therapist about just supplementing that, I agree. And um, 
the the link between the gut and mental health. So this is this is basically, you know, a huge part of your work, Dr. Uma. It's, it's I know something you talk about, Jenna, and it's the topic of Eve's latest book as well. Now, supplements can't really change the gut a lot. Perhaps with probiotics, Eve, we could talk about that a little bit. But can we talk about the link between food and the brain more specifically now? Um, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, and, and if anyone else would like to help with this, I think it would be great because everyone's an expert on this panel. You know, the, the, the burgeoning amount of research on the actual connection between the gut and the brain has occurred in the last two decades. However, you know, way back many, many decades ago, Hippocrates pointed to this in terms of, um, you know, diseases of the gut, um, of the brain sitting in the gut. And so he had this expression that I use in one of my, um, my lectures about. And, and I think the way to understand it, a way I break it down for people is that embryologically speaking, um, when our bodies are forming, the gut and brain form from the same cells in the body. And then they divide up and form these organs. Then they remain connected throughout life by the 10th cranial nerve called the vagus nerve. And I like to call that a, a, a two-way superhighway, which allows for 24-7 of chemical messaging back and forth. Um, then for mental health purposes, one of the most prescribed medications are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, such as Prozac or fluoxetine um, is an example of sertraline, um, otherwise called Zoloft. And more than 90% of those receptors are actually in the gut. Uh, so I think that's super helpful for people to understand as well. And then I think for these current times of what we're facing, it's also important for people to understand that most of our immune system is located in the gut. So our food, therefore, is one of the many, not the only, but one of the many elements to think about in terms of impacting that. And that's sort of how I break it down for people just as in a nutshell. And then, of course, there's many, many, many more details about the, the uh, 100 trillion organisms and all of that in the gut. But I'll let my colleagues chime in as well. Sorry, could we could I just ask you Eve to talk a little bit more about serotonin in the gut because I think people would be really unless you've heard that statistic that Dr. Uma just said that what over 90% of our serotonin receptors are actually receptors. Yep. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting it's a really surprising stat for a lot of people actually. Um, to be honest, we're not quite sure about how serotonin in the gut affects serotonin in the brain because that's what's called, so serotonin that we produce in our gut is something called peripheral serotonin. So it goes all around our body and serotonin in our gut actually helps with motility through the gut as well. But what's interesting is, is those, all of those trillions of microbes um, that live in our gut, they kind of essentially sort of switch on the serotonin um, sites in our gut. So to have a happy gut, you've also got to have some happy bugs going on in there as well, so they can do their job properly. So there's still a bit of, um, this, um, and it's a new science, as, as you sort of alluded to there earlier. It is sort of 20 years, really, which is kind of crazy when Hippocrates, way back when, you know, famously said, all disease begins in the gut. So we, we, we're only catching up now. Um, but what's interesting is that although we're not sure how serotonin that's produced in the gut necessarily crosses over the blood brain barrier, because it's thought that that doesn't happen, because we have a barrier around our brain that's really protective, so things can't move in and out. Um, we do know that the, the, the microbes in our gut do kind of in some way control the availability of what's called a precursor. So that's tryptophan. We take that in through a lot of protein rich foods. And so they have some level of control over how much tryptophan moves into uh, the brain that then gets changed into serotonin. So there's a direct and an indirect influence that our gut has on serotonin levels. But when we think, yeah, 90 to 95% of that is produced in our gut, it's kind of quite a mad stat. And also other neurotransmitters, so things like dopamine, which is our reward, pleasure-seeking neurotransmitter, but even things like melatonin. So often things like um, gut health and poor sleep and vice versa will affect each other. There's a whole chapter in my book about that. So there's a whole lot of neurotransmitters and there's a whole lot we don't know about that gut-brain connection. But what's really exciting, and I like your highway with the, with the vagus nerve um, mm -hmm. analogy as well, but what we always thought of as a top
vodka and other substances because there's a couple of ways in which they communicate but it is definitely this bi-directional conversation that's going on which is really exciting I love what you said and also just want to pick up on you know some of the virgin research because you're absolutely right it, it, you know it's 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 amazing that so many more of these studies have, com- have been completed in the last two decades um, but at the same time you know there are also more of the studies now that are looking at the psychobiome and the effect in mental health we know for example that there have been trials that looked in in human subjects that looked at the combination of comparing um, SSRI medications to the use of a probiotic So while we are still identifying the exact mechanisms on a cellular level um, and on a mitochondrial level, I think that what's important to understand is that there is this impact. And clinically, I see this all the time uh, when I ask people, uh, and we know that, you know, microbiome is like a thumbprint. So we know that everyone is not going to have the same response to dietary changes, but I have seen this clinically happen. And then there was a very promising article published in Wall Street Journal in uh, just before Christmas in December of 2020, which looked at the newest research in the microbiome, uh, which I thought was very promising. Some of the researchers were actually, I think, from Cork and others were from China, um, but they also were collaborating with uh, Scripps Institute in the US. So I think that you know people are really coming together in a good way and looking at quantifying where the research is at. And, and that particular article didn't overreach either you know it was sort of we there are certain things that we know or we're figuring out there's some things we don't know but here's what's important about the direction of the research and I think that's important for people to understand when they're trying to make dietary changes yeah definitely uh, that um that the, the study in Cork so I'm not sure if you're familiar I'm sure you probably are familiar with the book but just for people watching as well it's a really interesting book called the Microbiotics <laughs> Revolution and it talks about um not exclusively using probiotics because i want to be clear no it wasn't only probiotics any medications they shouldn't just stop taking that and then think that they can just work on their gut and that's enough but in conjunction with talking therapies but looking at um mostly in mice because obviously there's the um restrictions around using human subjects for these types of trials but but wiping the microbiome of mice and then observing that they had heightened stress responses they had they were exerting much more depressive anxious behaviors um so it's a i think it's a fascinating field to be in at the moment um the gut brain connection and how probiotics or gut health has a such a significant role in in helping to as it, you know in conjunction with other things helping to treat some of these things and just to add on from that i think eve what you're talking about there in mice is really interesting now actually what research is suggesting is that you can manage symptoms such as ibs or ibs like symptoms um through things like mindfulness, meditation, and that really goes to show how powerful that gut-brain connection is. Um, So really, if we can start to help people with their IBS symptoms through things like mindfulness, we no longer require further interventions. I think that's that's really key. Um, And additionally, just while we're talking about probiotics, I think it's really important for people to, to understand that there's such a range of probiotics, um, some out there which are fantastic and some out there which quite simply the live bacteria doesn't reach the gut. And I think that's really cr- crucial because there's so many people now just going into health food shops and picking probiotics off the shelf. And ultimately not everybody needs them. Yes, they can be really, really beneficial in certain situations, but not everyone needs them. And we do need to be aware of the quality of the supplement. Yeah. The other, the other thing, to, I agree with that. And I, the other thing I would I help p- people to sort of break down, because I, I think, again, it's it's how information gets um, shared with, with individuals who are really trying to improve their health. And, you know, um, if, if you say, don't know which probiotic to get, there are also ways to do this through food. So fermented foods bring back rich probiotics to your gut because of live active cultures and yogurt, things like kimchi, um, things like kefir, um, you know, every country has different versions of what they eat. There's tempeh, there's sauerkraut. Um, many of those actually can bring back healthy, uh, healthy uh, live bacteria to your gut. So there's there's more way than more ways than one to do it, um, and I think that you know people need to understand that that yes you can you can shop for the right supplement and consult your practitioner uh, before doing it so you get the right one for for your um, for your gut. But you can also do it through through foods that you're eating by just minor and simple dietary adjustments and make your food actually more interesting and fun with healthy ingredients. Mm. 
So um, I think I think with probiotics we have a classic example of where people might go for a supplement before they look at changes in their diet. But mm -hmm. um, in fact, you're quite right, Dr. Uma, that it's in fact dietary change that can have the biggest impact on on the gut. And I think one of the big roles is fibre as well in that. So maybe somebody would like to talk a bit more about the role of fibre in our diet and the impact that has on the gut microbiome. Well, I'll, I'll, jump, I'll, I'll jump in for a second here just to say that I'm, I'm embarrassed that in the United States we care so much about protein, but actually we're sad, sadly lacking in fibre in our diet. And I'll say that quite honestly, because I see it all the time that, you know, we, um, I, I say, I say this clients all the time as well, but part of it is that people have, you know, had sometimes a misconception of fiber, right? They think it's only a supplement of something that an older person may be having, and they don't realize it's something that we vitally need, especially for, because of the gut microbiome or those hundred odd trillion uh, microbes in the gut that need to be nourished and fed and fibers where you help feed them. So I always lead with, you know, talking about, um, talking about fruit, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, legumes, healthy whole grains, if you consume all of those and can tolerate them because they're the, some of the best sources of fiber um, and you don't get fiber from animal or seafood protein. So I just sort of put it in a nutshell for them. And, in, and certainly in the United States, remind them that, hey guys, you know, don't worry about counting those protein grams because it's actually fiber that you're missing. And it turns out that only one in 10 of us also get enough of our vegetables. So, so it's, an, it's another reason to bring it in uh, as from statistics in the US. Things, things are no better in, I mean, I've been in the UK <laughs> For many years and we've we've got our troubles here definitely don't we even jenna but but in australia the um westmead hospital which is a very large hospital outside sydney that does a lot of work with diabetes they've identified um scurvy returning so in looking at diabetic thoughts but just for the um general as for our people here one of the one of the complications of diabetes can be developing ulcers that don't heal and vitamin C has a huge role in that healing process. And Westmead published their paper about 10 of their, um, their, um, their, their clients, for being a nutritionist, 10 of their patients actually mm -hmm. having scurvy, not yeah. from um, extreme diets or not from any macro fad. These were just ordinary middle-aged Australians who just didn't eat a lot of vegetables and what vegetables they did eat, they boiled the living daylights out of and mm -hmm. over the years they've, they've developed a disease that we associate with Victorian slums or with mm. you know, with pirates and mm -hmm. it's true in medical school that what we were taught was you know vitamin c and, and because of lack of vitamin c and fresh produce on ships uh, back in the day uh, sailors would develop scurvy you know that was one of the ways that they kind of impress upon you that um, not only the importance of the diet, uh, but, but, you know, vitamin C. So that's, that's really interesting to know. Yeah, I think, I mean, fiber, I think another way to kind of like, in terms of gut health and fiber, I always sort of explain it in a way that fiber is food for our microbes. If you don't give them food, the food they eat, they need to eat, then you, you're essentially starving them. So it's just an easy way of an easy kind of concept to get into somebody's head. But I guess this is where things like I'm not into fads at all, as you know, Rare, but I do feel like veganuary has some plus points to it, coming back to that, in that it just it's not necessarily making people turn vegan. It's more about how can we eat less or eat more responsibly when it comes to meat and, and how can we be inspired to eat more plants. And I think maybe doing that type of thing for a period of time can help people to find inspiration because obviously like having a big movement around that means there's more recipes online and things because a lot of it is um knowing what to do with it so um you know you can say as, as a as a practitioner you can say oh yeah you need to eat more broccoli or you need to eat more vegetables but then they're like well how the hell do i do that like mm -hmm. if not somebody's coming at it with no experience no like io to like actually or kind of inspiration in terms of cooking so I think a lot of it's that as well so it's about giving people tools in which they can um create diversity but also create delicious diversity because that's the thing that's going to keep them going back to eating more plants and having more variety in the diet when it comes to fiber 
you know, on my social media platform, uh, which is at Dr. Uma Naidu, which is spelled at D-R-U-M-A-N-A-I-D-O-O, -O, I mentioned that because we decided to approach the new year, new you, with a different way of making it fun for people and making, putting a positive spin on any, um, any regrets that people may have been having after the holidays. And so last week we did a challenge, a bingo challenge, which is all online and anyone can participate about really eating the, the different kinds of vegetables and greens in your diet exactly for your gut microbiome to feed those uh, feed those bugs a good diet and then week two is about how can you include different fermented foods just really so people have a fun puzzle that they're working on but to connect the dots around those nutrients that the gut microbiome needs um, to really help them thrive and to stay out keep them in a good balance and so that the good microbes outweigh the bad microbes in the microbiome and the gut and so that you um, really fend off things like inflammation that can get set up so I think it's just it's just a, a way for a way to help uh, share those those positive messages uh, through January. And, also and just to add on to that, um, I think when it comes to increasing fiber consumption, it needs to be done slowly. So anyone who isn't eating, you know, significant amounts of fiber at the moment, and they're sitting here thinking, oh, you know what, I'm going to go ahead, go away and focus on that. It needs to be done slowly. Otherwise, you may find that you experience you experience undesirable gut symptoms. So. Do it slowly, maybe increase your portion of fiber um, or fibrous rich foods one per day. Yeah, so clinically and medically speaking, people with IBS, IBD, and SIBO, which is small intestine, intestine, intestinal bacterial overgrowth, do have to be careful with fiber. Um, you know, they, they have to be because they may, they may not be able to tolerate fiber. It can actually exacerbate their medical and gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, and I think with everyone else, do it slowly if you're not eating many vegetables and fruit. Um, all the things that I named earlier that contain fiber, definitely do it slowly, but especially individuals who have medical conditions um, that they're seeing a gastroenterologist for like IBS, IBD and SIBO to start. Yeah, you definitely don't want to go from zero to hero with fiber. <laughs> you have a trumpeting circus down there and everyone will hate us on this discussion. But I think the other thing, and somebody just popped it in the chat, um, about seasonal eating. So I'm massively about seasonal eating as well, um, just because, for many reasons, actually, but actually quite largely because of a sustainability perspective. But also, um, when we talk about fiber, it's not just about quantity of fiber when it comes to gut health. So I think a lot of the time, we, and I'm guilty of this as well, like you just gravitate around the same types of fruit and vegetables when actually how we build a more diverse microbiome, which the research suggests the more diverse, so the more different types of species of microbes we have in the gut, the stronger and the healthier it is. And the, the way we can achieve that is by having diverse amounts of fiber in the diet. So not having the same fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds and whole grains. And there's and people sometimes think, oh, Christ, now I've got to eat more fibre and I've got to get diversity. Like, you're just, you're stressing me out, which is the exact opposite of what we're trying to achieve here, right? So it's things like having, um, I often get clients to do, like, nuts and seed mixes because then they get quite a lot of different ones in there. Or if you're somebody that has oats every morning, just have some other grains, like spelt flakes, rye flakes, or whatever, mix and match with nut butters, have um, frozen... Um, fruits and vegetables is really good as well or like batch cooking and so if you buy your fruit and veg and then you, you cook up quite a lot of it and then you can put that in the freezer that's also time saving as well so there are easy ways to get like rotation around those but I think it's an important point when it comes to gut health that it is about diversity not just quantity and just to add on from that um Eve talking about you know trying to provide all this information and causing people more stress we know that stress has a really negative impact on gut health and the gut microbiome. So if people can get really caught up in trying to make sure that everything's perfect and that they're doing everything that we're talking about and everything that they read about, you know, and it becomes too much, sometimes it's about stripping it back and saying, let's focus on one thing at a time. I always say to people that there's no such thing as, as the perfect diet and don't try and strive for perfection. Just focus on where you are at the moment and focus on one thing that you can improve rather than trying to do everything overnight because it would just be far too stressful. Push themselves too hard, they ping back to where they were before. You know. Yeah, exactly. Right, let's talk about the future now. Um, so we have now some lab-grown meat coming forward. We have, we have a lot, um, 
perhaps with Brexit, some potentially big changes in agriculture in Britain, where does everybody see the future of food? I mean, I think it's quite a scary time in, in many regards. I mean, also, there's a lot of shifts now happening because of Brexit and things like that. So we don't really know. There's definitely going to be some changes there. But I feel like sometimes as well, it's a bit like coming back down to fads and stuff. It can get a bit reductionist in that, you know, it's either good or bad to eat meat or it's either good or bad to be vegan. And actually, it's not really that clear cut. And I think... Um, the more inclusive we can be in the diet, but just be more mindful around where we're sourcing our food is really, for me anyway, that's kind of where I try and educate clients about eating more locally, eating more seasonally, um, ultimately will help to support a more sustainable food system. Um, but that's, I mean, this is like a personal opinion on this stuff. I, I do worry a little bit about some of the... Um, overly processed but processed meats for sure for various reasons um also I, you know i'm not a big fan of um industrialized farming i think it's you, they definitely there needs to be a massive change but is the change and this is i guess to the rest of the panel is the change to then make um lots of lab grown meats and um you know plant-based burgers because there's definitely issues with that as well so i'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that you guys i think from a health perspective um going down the lab grown meats and the plant alternatives um so the, the ultra processed sort of plant alternatives that we're talking about i, I don't think that's necessarily going to be as beneficial for our health but i think from a sustainable point of view um we're definitely heading more towards a plant-based diet and focusing more on those plant foods and naturally as a result of that we're going to find a huge increase in these meat alternatives um, and you know things that have been genetically um, created and I think that we need to be aware of that and not get too sucked in it's so easy you know especially with the, the impossible burger something like that it's so easy to say oh wow you know it's a plant burger that tastes like meat and it's, it's fantastic actually if we step back really our number one focus should be on whole foods whole real foods yeah, I agree, I agree with that completely. You know, I think that um, in terms of the United States, I feel like people are making very many efforts. There's certainly a plant-based movement. There are, you know, there's every type of different diet going on. Um, and I think it's up to individuals to make those choices. My position on much of this is that I consider myself diet agnostic. And what do I mean by that is that when people come in to see me as a nutritional psychiatrist with mental health issues, I try my best to offer them the evidence and to guide them along the path that they're on, whatever diet they might be eating. But if it is a fat diet and it's, you know, something like give up an entire food group or, um, or, or something that seems a little unreasonable and not balanced, I always guide them to a healthy whole foods diet. So I talk about eat the orange, skip the store-bought orange juice for multiple reasons, including the fact that the store-bought orange juice lacks the fiber, the vitamins, the minerals, and has a ton of added sugar. Um, so it's that sort, of, that sort of concept. But then there are a few other things. I have pillars of mental health that I work with individuals on. And I do feel that, you know, whatever diet that someone is using in the United States, that they can start to, you know, we can all up our, our game, including myself. And I say that because the standard American diet is very painfully difficult to even read or see what it is because it's tons of processed and ultra processed foods um, you know things like uh, processed meat products have nitrates which drive depression and this has been shown in research so I go back to here's wh where can we start with you with your diet with how you're eating and really go from a whole foods um, approach of just building blocks of, you know, eat the rainbow, adding vegetables to your diet, you know, building up that fiber into your diet, cutting back on the added and refined sugars, because here's why they're more often in savory foods um, than they are in sweet foods, because they're hidden. Um, the, the added sugars are hidden, teaching food people about food labels. There are upwards of 200 other names for sugar on food labels in the United States. So giving them a, a little almost a little toolkit of information that they can improve their diet along a path with my guidance in nutritional psychiatry to to really up their game but using a whole foods plant-based approach with a focus on gut health because that is so much now um, uh, you know a, a way to think about the connection to the gut brain access into mental health. Do you think Dr. Uma that doctors will be uh, going to pick up 
prescribing foods? No. I, I'm, I'm hoping that. Uh, that's certainly the, the direction I would love to see happen. Um, but I also feel like there are lots of gaps in medical education. You know, uh, in our medical schools, this research has been done on the gap of nutrition education. So individuals like myself go out and study it separately because we have a love for it or we, we want to fill in that gap in our education. Um, you know, and I think that um, I would hope that that movement goes toward in being more inclusive of just nutrition nutrition and dietary mechanisms. Um, I have to say that, that I think it's, it's, I think that the functional medicine, functional nutrition physicians and clinicians and prescribers, as well as lifestyle medicine doctors in the US are definitely more incorporating uh, nutritional strategies. But I do think that we're in the early stages. And um, certainly, I, I hope to um, in, in my slow and steady movement, be able to impact some change there because I just think it's such the missing gap in the conversation around mental well being. And I have, say, I have to say, I think nutrition, maybe I'm just hoping it, I think nutrition <laughs> is having much more of a, a salient role in most people's lives now than it ever has done because everybody's <laughs> been forced to cook and they're actually having to. I'm really not, I get what you're saying about labels and things like that, but I really try and get clients not to obsess over labels because it just gets a bit out of hand and then they well stop. I think it's education yeah. right because no, no, if people exactly. don't have the information then yeah. they don't know that they're consuming sugar true, true. Uh, added and sugars yeah just read into that kind of unhealthy yeah. relationship with food and actually at the end of the day we are going to eat processed sometimes ultra processed foods because that's just life but what I think has been really interesting for a lot of people during the lockdowns and what we're going through now is that they're having to cook at home so they're even though they're not necessarily nest having to check they're, they're just more aware of what they're mm -hmm. doing with their food and their nutrition and somebody put in the chat box here I just saw about their, their study in culinary medicine which I think is amazing and I think there'll be a much bigger role for that kind of helping to bridge the gap between a practitioner and the person listening to this or wanting to make improvements in their diet, but maybe not ready to just, you know, necessarily get into it that deeply, but just more to make, I guess, informed, empowering. And that's why you've written your book, Dr. Uma, and why I wrote mine and why um, Jenna's got her, you know, business and Rhea does all of her amazing things. It's really there to empower people because at the end of the day, nutrition is one that we all do, you know, we have three meals a day and we're not there to help clients every single meal so it's about giving them some of those um you know just some basic things on how they can sort of start to build on that but i think what what this time has done is it's essentially bring people back to their food and reconnect with their food in a way that maybe we got massively disassociated with and i i do think you know some of the fad diets and things like that have got a bit of a you know a responsibility for that type of yeah. you know dysfunctional relationship that we got with our food absolutely you know being someone who treats actively uh, individuals with eating disorders and also the healthy end of that spectrum being orthorexia uh, which is that sort of healthy supposedly healthy habit development but almost developing an unhealthy habit or sort of a fixation on being healthy becomes so important so i couldn't agree with you more i just feel that you know um, to answer Rhea's question, I just think the more snippets of education or, or, or food bites, as I call them, of information that people have, the more informed their decisions can be. And to work with someone or really get your information well vetted from a source of a qualified person who can share and help you guide your path, uh, whatever that may be. be. I personally think, you know, simple healthy habit and nutrition can be drinking enough water. Um, you know, a simple thing like that can be just one habit change that a person makes today. And I think it all begins at a different point for someone, so I couldn't agree more. And just following on from Dr. Eames talking about education and really where you're getting your sources from, Eve's absolutely right. You know, more and more people are cooking and they're focused on their health and their nutrition, especially given the pandemic and the fact that we all need to be so much more aware of our health at the moment. But at the same time, I think that opens up to so many people, you know, having opinions and following fad diets and therefore relaying that onto other people and saying well this has worked for me you know it's going to work for you and we have to remember that we're all so unique and what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for another so please do make sure that you're getting your information from reputable sources i can't stress that enough so jenny you really feel that the future is personalized 
I think the future is personalized. I don't think we're there yet at all. And I think that we are jumping the gun massively. You know, there's so many DNA tests out there that you can do online. And we simply don't have the research um, or the massive amount of um, evidence that we need to be able to support those tests. And people are going away doing these tests and then coming back and saying, oh, I'm allergic to this food and that food and this food. And actually there's absolutely no way of, t- of, say- of telling that through kind of like your hair strand. So please don't get sucked into these online DNA testing. You know, the more that we advance in nutrition, the more fads that are gonna be released. So I would say, yes, I think the future is personalized, but I really don't think that we're anywhere near um, being able to personalize it for the general population just yet. I do think that there are so many fundamentals that make a big difference. And I know for me, because people are beginning to ask about tests and we'll get into questions in just a moment, but I think people underestimate the impact of food on their mood. And if they begin to start monitoring that just for themselves, the link between feeling really, really flat after having something very sugary or something hyper-processed, people underestimate the impact that it can have on them and how much better they can feel on some better quality food. Definitely. I mean, there are studies out there to show how even something like a bowl of porridge, which is, you know, packed full of complex carbohydrates and fiber can have massive differences on individuals' blood sugar levels. So for some, for one individual, it might massively spike their blood sugar levels, whereas for another one, it may not. And as a result, that too can have an, imp- an impact on our mood. So I think you're absolutely right, Red, you know, being aware of how food makes you feel personally is a really good place to start, but you don't need to be going spending your money on, you know, a lot of these um, tests that you can buy online. The real, the one thing I would say about personalized medicine is we head in that direction because, you know, the thing that we haven't mentioned, but, but people should understand is that microbiome also involves our genetics and uh, those are, those are unique. So, so just as we develop this with some individuals, I do work on a more personalized plan, but others, because the, our microbiome is really like a thumbprint, they may actually fall into categories that I can, you know, they, they can have follow general pillars of nutritional psychiatry, whereas others made a more definitive plan plan but I couldn't agree with my colleagues more I think all of this is still developing but you know the, the microbiome research will, will get us there in time it's just going on right now it, it, it is and we've got Tim Spector here in the UK as part of the prevent diet which is an enormous yeah. an enormous um, piece of research to try and look at the impact of food on the microbiome you know he began looking at people who were genetically identical but had vastly different microbiomes mm-hmm. so it's, it's a fascinating time to be involved in this and the impact of, of nutrients and even high levels of some nutrients on brain function is also really fascinating. So I haven't had a chance to get into your book yet, but I am looking for it. And Eve, I still use your book with nearly all my clients too. Your fabulous. Well, I think that's what's, I mean, that's interesting because there's somebody actually started asking about nutrigenetics. I don't know if that's how yes, we got nutrigenetics. Yeah, so I think Dr. Umas, right, I mean, we, we, our microbes have um, a hell of a lot more genetic material than we do. Mm-hmm. So if you want to start shaping your genetics, you kind of need to, it comes back down to gut health, really. Yep. So, um, mm-hmm. before you go, I, I agree with Jenna, I think there's a lot of bogus tests out there. Um, there's some, I mean, some really mad ones, actually, to be honest with you. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it sounds it sounds so basic, but I think sometimes it's good to start with basics because I'm, I'm sure that my colleagues can also attest to this, that you see clients and they want to go from like this place to like here. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, it doesn't really matter what powder you're putting in into your morning smoothie. You're not actually sleeping very well. You're not having a bowel movement. So let's start yeah. with that, shall we? So, you know, I think yeah. there's basically like having more fi- like in- gently increasing your fiber having more diversity in your fiber sources before mm-hmm. you even get into any of that and that in turn will naturally start to shape your genetics and support your genetics because mm-hmm. as you say most of 
your microbes actually house a lot more of that than, than we do so yeah you know I, I always I always my 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 one of my most important pillars is education and I feel that at least if people know what they're headed towards they can make informed decisions and I I feel strongly about that because I feel they don't know there are upwards of 200 names for sugar and food labels they I have people come in coming in consuming things that they shouldn't be or or with, which is not good for their mental well-being so I agree you know it's it's really about finding the approach that works for someone in a sensible way with the guidance of, of a um, of really a qualified practitioner to work with them and guide them on those uh, decisions to get a test or not. I think that some of that is very important. So I, I agree with you. It's also a segue, uh, Dr. Uma, we were talking before, uh, you have a story that I really love that really illustrates people getting into very sort of elaborate things when something very, very basic is happening. Uh -huh. That's your uh -huh. light bulb coffee moment. Could you just share that? I'd be happy to. So as a very young um, resident doctor, which is, uh, I guess, I think in the US you call it a registrar, I can't remember, but uh, in the UK, I know the name is different, but a trainee. So I was studying psychiatry at Harvard and um, it was pretty, you know, uh, pretty new and a uh, patient came in about three weeks after his initial appointment with me and he walked in you know to his appointment yelling at me saying you know you caused me to gain all this weight doctor and I kind of I was I had his chart open on my computer so I knew that that wasn't true because you knew his baseline weight and we began a conversation and I was kind of timid you know I was new to this and learning about psychotropic medications which are complicated as it is but he had in his uh, hand a very large cup of coffee, which in the United States is a 20 ounce, which is pretty large. And it's a traditional coffee that people love in Boston called Dunkin' Donuts, if you've seen it or been to Boston or parts of the US. And for some reason, my eyes, uh, as he was yelling, looked at this cup of coffee and it, it was an aha moment because I sort of said to him, well, you know what, Bill, what, why don't you tell me, I'm just making up that name, but you know, why don't you tell me what you put in your coffee? And part of it was probably the scared, scared, timid, you know, young resident wanting to distract him. But another part of me kind of tapped into something and he said, well, yes, you know, I, I, this is what I drink every morning. And, and then when we broke it down and we got online together on my, compu on my computer and we, sh we basically understood that he put in more than a quarter cup of processed creamer in his coffee and eight teaspoons of sugar every single day. And he was having one and a half of those a day because of the job that he did. And it really was a very powerful moment because I could see him, his attitude change, his affect changed. He became understanding of the information. He understood what I was saying. He could see how I calculated. It was simple. It was just showing him what he was putting in that 20 ounce cup of coffee. And it really changed the nature of our clinical work together. It was a way in which I really learned that by showing someone a different way of approaching the very same thing, you know, he could have the coffee, he could maybe have less of it, but he could do it differently, it was very, very different. And when I realized the power that that type of um, information can have on an individual's mental well being and ultimately his physical well being, right? Because you also lost weight over time naturally because he was eating and embracing a healthier diet by using those small habit changes, uh, was really an aha moment for me. And it was one of the things that really led to me um, focusing in on not only going to study nutrition, but also finding a way to build this into the questions I was asking patients. Yeah, because he was, he was thinking it was his medication. and He, he was, was thinking it was his medication that I had prescribed. A day just in coffee. You know, we have, we have similar issues. So we've got a lot of questions and, um, and some of them we've already answered about nutrigenomics and there's um, Lisa Pierce just said to us that there's a recent report from Waitrose, which is a supermarket that we have here, Dr. Uma, which yes. is suggested that cooking is taken over from the commute as people are working from home, coming back to what Eve was saying. And educating people from Olga, educating people to read labels is important. If you don't understand what's, what's on the label, don't eat it, which is... Um, and what supplements currently launched from the Dalesford range are specific for gut health? We have a whole gut section in the Dalesford range. So in keeping with what we've been talking about tonight, if you go into a Dalesford shop, the first place I get you to stop is at the market garden vegetables. 
grab some of those. And then there are enzymes and there's gentle cultures and probiotics there for you if, if you've got some gut discomfort. Um, multiple do what would you suggest if someone was given multiple doses of antibiotics as a child and as a teen for bad skin? Um, and there's actually a number of questions about teens, teens and stress and things like that, Eve? Well, not related to skin, but um, gosh, we're all we're reciting our, our journeys into nutrition. But um, so gut health found me, not the other way around, basically, in that I um, was, I, was I, I had another career before nutrition. Um, I've been practicing nutrition for 12 years. But before that, I was in the heady uh, world of fashion PR and it was anything but healthy or gut friendly. And I had to take multiple, multiple doses of antibiotics. Like at one point I was taking them prophylactically. So every day to prevent another infection, it was sort of kidney bladder infections. And so to that person there, who's thinking that they're at a bit of a wit's end, I've been there, I know the feeling, but it is, you can definitely start to um, restore your gut health. It might not be a linear process, um, and it's, there's definitely no silver bullet or panacea. It's not going to be like one probiotic that's going to help, you know, get your gut back to being incredible. But little by little, our gut and our bodies are very adept at healing. And, um, you know, as long as you give your microbiome plenty of fuel in the way of fiber, um, do lots of things to help support that gut brain connection, because stress is one of the biggest um, triggers for IBS and gut related symptoms. Yeah. So doing all of that stuff, getting good quality sleep, there's 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 a multiple of pillars. I think that's the thing is that we want to, and I see this with a lot of clients is that we want the silver bullet. And I, like I said, I was there, but I don't want that person to be disheartened because they definitely can start to shift things in the with the next meal that they choose to eat, literally. Mm. Um, so yeah. So, so we've only got four minutes left, but I think we could maybe look at Deb Fitt's question, which is a comment about dairy-free and gluten-free, if not celiac or lactose intolerant. Does anybody want to comment on that? So um, I think when it comes to looking at dairy-free diets, obviously now there's a huge ethical element to it and sustainable element to it as well. So if we take that out of the question and we just focus on the health element for, what, for a moment, um, when you do go dairy free, you are increasing your risk of other nutrients. So things like iodine, vitamin B12, calcium. Um, so it's really important that if you if you are going dairy free, that's fine. But just make sure that you're replacing these nutrients in other ways. So be that by consuming fortified plant alternatives. Um, make sure that you're consuming a wide variety of green leafy vegetables, nuts, specifically almonds are a really good source of calcium. Iodine's a little bit more challenging to get from the diet, especially if you don't eat white fish. So um, it's largely found in dairy and white fish. And if you are removing dairy, then ensure that you're consuming white fish regularly. And if you're on a vegan diet, then make sure that you're consuming foods such as seaweed. Um, prunes are also a really good source of iodine as well. So absolutely fine, but making sure that you're not at risk of deficiency is really important. So as long as you're replacing those nutrients, then you should be okay. And, and the other, sorry, the other important thing with dairy, and I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, Jenna, was, um, is certainly in the United States, we, I talk about the sourcing of dairy for those who are consuming dairy, um, and that that would be um, grass milk dairy. So, you know, we know that when we used to see photographs of cows, they were eating grass, and we want, the, uh, we want them to be eating uh, the right diet if we're going to buy or purchase or use the milk. The other thing um, about, because dairy is also considered to be somewhat inflammatory in certain individuals, separate to lactose intolerance, but also in nutritional psychiatry in certain mental health conditions, which I outlined in my book. And I know we're close to the end, so I want to show people a picture of it, the food mood connection, um, is that um, there are certain there are types of proteins in milk, um, A1 and A2 proteins in certain conditions are actually driven by the, the proteins in milk. And so we do have have A2 milk in the US and certain individuals with uh, different men mental health conditions or symptoms of mental health conditions may need to consume that because they have a uh, worsening of symptoms with the A1 milk. Mm -hmm. So that those are the a few caveats that I add in with, with dairy or, you know, whether you're having dairy or you're not having dairy. I would um, so love to keep going. <laughs> 
so many more questions. The link between food and the brain is enormous and the need for education is enormous. And we have Jenna, who is fantastic with education, with the fruit and yogurt. The um, Yogurt and Juice Network. Yogurt and Juice Network. And, I'm sorry, yeah. Jenna. And, That's all right. And also, I think that we've got access to two pieces of beautiful quality information in Dr. Uma's The Food Mood Connection. And I would really encourage people to pursue that. It's a very, very stressful time for a lot of us. And don't underestimate the impact that food can have on your brain. And we've got Happy Gut, Happy Mind with Eve. And um, both of those have got recipes in them. Jenna's got a great ginger and almond biscuit recipe on her website at the moment that I will be making in the next couple of days. So um, please do get those books and, and have a look. I've already, I'm three quarters of the way through Eve's book and, and Dr. Uma, I've got yours lined up for as soon as I'm finished. Thank, Thank you. you everybody, everybody for being with us tonight. And we wish you all the health in the world and may, 2021 be a little bit more peaceful for us as the months go on. So take care and good night. And thank you to my fabulous panel of guests for giving us your time. Take care, everybody. Good night. Thank you all so much.